little bit about Contract, Comtrust, who we are in partnership with today. Contract uh, is a digital platform that connects highly skilled communication, marketing, creative and digital experts with contract jobs across Australia and New Zealand. Contract enables employers to source qualified vetted consultants from a talented pool of over 4,300 experts and provide access to a diverse and exciting range of short and long-term projects across corporate, government, consumer, industry, organisation and agencies. It's the easiest way to find and engage communications, creative, digital and marketing talent. And now I'd like to introduce our panellists individually who, are, who we're extremely privileged to have with us today. First of all, I'd like to introduce Kate Russell. Hi, Kate. Kate is our General Manager of Business Development at Comtract. Kate is also a business mentor in the fashion industry with over 12 years of agency and in-house experience in marketing and communications across varied industries such as premium fashion, retail and technology. Welcome, Kate. Nikki Drinkwater is our next panellist. Hi, Nikki. She is a leader with 20 years spent working in successful global and local brands here and overseas. As a former dual international heptathlete and rugby player, she draws on a decade of elite sport experience to help others harness values-based cultures to drive high-performance teams. She's also a mum to two future girl bosses aged 9 and 11, and she joins us today on day two of her new role at NBN Co. Welcome, Nikki. Yolanda Ace. Yolanda is a truly global CMO, having worked in South Africa, UK, Spain, Budapest and Australia and has transformed and grown more some of the world's most iconic food and beverage brands across both retail and FMCG. With a strong, um, oh sorry, Yolanda has recently accepted a new role starting in November, joining Founders First Team as Marketing and Innovation Director. With a strong background in liquor, I am truly hoping that Yolanda will be my best friend in the future. Adrian Aguli Andolo, oh, I knew I'd stuff this up. Adrian, can you please tell everybody your surname? Squilliandolo. Thank you. I'm very sorry. Adrian started her uni degree in event management and changed to HR after having worked in fashion retail as she wanted to make a difference to people. Adrian has worked her way out through people and culture positions and is now the people and culture advisor for Cricket Australia. Adrian has been a driving force behind flexibility in the workforce and enabling Cricket Australia to adopt and adapt to flexible working practices for success. Welcome, Adrian. So I've had the pleasure of meeting with this inspiring and experienced panel over last month, and I look forward to sharing their wisdom with you today. So enough from me, but before we go into the questions, I just wanna recap on a couple of stats about flexibility in the workforce, and particularly in relation to women. Over 30% of Australia's freelancers or contractors currently in our workforce. The number of skills Australian workers have for an advertised role is two out of 18. And $10.8 billion could be added to the economy by increasing gender diversity. And we know that a huge number of women are exiting the workforce every year and only 26% of full-time employees in Australia are women, just over a quarter. So first, let's start with the big question. What does flexibility mean to you? Starting with you, Yolanda, what does it mean and, to you? Well, we're definitely, we're definitely diving into the big question first. I think, um, I think for me, flexibility really means when you work and where you work. And long gone are the nine to five office-based jobs. So I think flexibility is, is really something different for everybody. And as individuals, we really need to lean into what does that look like and what does it mean for us? Um, we often look at flexibility from our perspective as the, um, as the employee, but I would encourage everybody on the call to kind of consider what flexibility means for your manager or the person you're working for. We sometimes forget that um, managers are under an enormous amount of pressure or organizations have a lot of responsibility and commitments to also achieve. And um, that's why flexibility um, and being able to be flexible is a two-way conversation. 
you have got to have that conversation with your manager to understand where are the, the parameters for being flexible and what are the pressures they are under as well that might prevent them from giving you the flexibility you need. So for me, it's, um, you know, flexibility is different for everyone and it definitely starts with a conversation. Yeah, the end. Apologies. What does flexibility look like, Adrian, at Cricket Australia? Yeah, so for us, it's really just about trust and honesty. And, you know, we trust you to be able to manage your workload and your workday as you see fit. So um, from day one, everyone is set up to work flexibly and that's, you know, from, from home. And, and we also have an all roles flex policy. So that's been in place for just over two years now at CA. And, and what that does, it, it gives our people the opportunity to structure their work week how they like. So, you know, we have some people who work nine day fortnights, others who work you know, days like 7 till 2.30, and others who choose to work from home maybe once or twice a week. Um, we have really found that that adoption is based on the manager. So there's a lot of people out there, and, and I think we're all guilty of it at times, who have that traditional way of working and only kind of choose to work flexibly and, and from home um, when it's really a purpose-based decision. So, you know, you might have an appointment and you think, I'll just work from home so I don't have to travel into the office. But for us, it's really about changing that mindset so that everybody can put flexibility into their work week and have a better balance with their life. So, um, yeah, that's that's CA for you. Thanks, Adrian. Over to you, Nikki. As a um, previous consultant, um, what are why are full time corporates leaving and moving into contract based roles? Um, oh, I was just thinking about flexibility there, Ange, but um, that's a great question. So um, for me, with working in an interim capacity, and maybe just to explain um, for those that have joined us, um, I worked in-house as a full-time permanent employee at Coca-Cola Amatil for five years. And then in my last year, I worked in an interim capacity um, really working project based so you know I've seen a corporate environment as a full-time employee and on an interim um, on an interim basis and for me um, the things that are really relevant when you're working in an interim capacity are equally relevant for everyone right now when we're working in times of real uncertainty um, or, or in with a lot of change um, and so the things that you know I put down to success and, and my tips would be um, number one Think about and prioritise being ruthless with your prioritisation. Um, it's now more important than ever. Um, teams are smaller. Um, what our customers need is different. So now more than ever, we have um, that permission and we have that expectation to prioritise the things that are really important and don't try and do everything. So that was my first tip. Um, secondly, for me, it's about bringing in external insight um, and having that being okay with being an independent thinker. And if you think about, if you're brought in as a contractor, you're brought in as, in as a contractor because the company you're in doesn't have either the expertise or the skill set that you've got. So you need to bring what, what you bring into, into your company. Um, and also at the moment with the environment that we're in, no one knows what the future holds. So the opportunity, you know, whether you're in-house or, or you're brought in as, as a contractor is think about bringing in external insight, triangulate information, use your network, ask questions, consult those around you, whether it's, you know, someone that you know from a different industry, a sponsor or a mentor from a different role um, or, you know, anyone else in your network. Try and get different sources of information and then think about what those perspectives mean and make your own view and bring that external insight into the, the organisation. That's really important for understanding the environment that you're operating in because only then can you make good decisions. And probably the third one and, and you know, probably the most important is um, having the empathy and courage in your relationship building. Very rarely now do I see people making decisions and leading by telling people what to do. You've probably all seen it as well, but more and more it's around um, how you influence people and how you work with other people to deliver outcomes. Um, so think about that. Um, you know, like I said, consult, work with people that are your subject matter experts, work with people that, can, that know you personally and can give you advice, work with people that will coach and mentor you. 
um, and try and really focus on building collaborative relationships that give you win-win outcomes as opposed to thinking about what you need um, or how you can get your way. I think that that's more important than ever now. Thanks, Nikki. And obviously adaptability is something that people are looking for and you're clearly adaptable because I asked you the wrong question and you still responded. But um, <laughs> prepare for all situations, Anne. Excellent, prepare for all situations. Excellent. But, um, <laughs> but on on the subject of um, flexibility, really, I was just going to reiterate um, everything that um, Yolanda already talked about and Adrian talked about. That's absolutely my experience. And you know, to start with uh, as an elite athlete, but working too, flexibility for me, like the lady said, meant being having the flexibility to work around training and around competing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I moved to Australia 10 years ago um, as a mum with young kids and a husband that was working full time. And flexibility then meant something very different. Um, when I started my job at the Waratahs, I remember going for interviews and I had a two month old daughter and a two year old. Um, and literally to get to the interview, my husband had to meet me in the car park. We handed over the just fed sleeping baby so he could babysit for two hours so I could do the interview, come back, feed and sleep again. Um, and then, you know, as Adrian mentioned, things like nine day fortnights, things like the flexibility to work in a way that suits you. And as Yolanda mentioned, as an, as an employer or an organisation, if you don't offer flexibility, you are literally not choosing from the whole talent pool because if you can't, you know, you don't have those people that need flex for their work or, or need flex for their parenting. Um, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage as an organisation, definitely. And, and that's why we only have 26% full-time employees as women, um, which seems like a shame because I think we have a lot to offer um, ongoing. So thanks, Nikki, for that. Um, over to you, Kate. Kate, why do you think companies are looking to use freelancers and consultants and contractors versus full-time employees as a way of the future? Yeah, so, I mean, I think this shift has been happening for a while, um, looking at, you know, how we change this kind of full-time workforce to though that with a higher proportion of freelancers. Um, I think what's happened in the last six months and the events has meant that this has been fast-tracked. So, um, especially in the marketing and communications industry, it's not new. Um, it has been shifting to a more kind of contract and freelance for a while. Um, but like with many things, when change happens, sometimes it just happens a lot quicker. Um, I think in terms of why companies are realising the advantages of being able to source temporary, uh, I guess, uh, workers with specific skills. So one of the things that um, I think Nikki touched on was that, you know, as much as we'd love, we'd love that unicorn employee who could literally do everything. Um, I mean, I'm, I would love to hire five of them and I think everyone would love that. However, the reality is that, you know, that isn't always the case. And so companies are needing to look at people with a certain skill set to be able to hire into it. Now, in terms of, it also allows a company to manage costs better. So. It's a pretty competitive marketplace at the moment and a contingent workforce allows them to be able to align the costs of employing staff with the number of sales their business makes. It means the employees have the flex, the employers actually, sorry, have the flexibility to increase and decrease staff numbers as required. So further to that kind of point on flexibility, also with seasonal changes, um, you know, if you have a consultant, you can bring them in for say a Christmas period at retail when we know that it's going to be uber busy. And perhaps as a company, you don't want to commit to 12 months of having a marketing manager when you could bring them in for say a three month project. Um, it also allows a little bit of a try before you buy. So is this person the right fit? Um, and are they going to deliver the skills that we've just mentioned that we really need? Um, it also is about challenging traditional hierarchies. You know, outsourcing as part of the workforce really shifts the power structure as well. Um, the consultant brings in fresh ideas. Um, they're able to kind of, I guess, challenge perhaps some traditional ways of thinking that a full-time employee may actually be able to or maybe not and so it's about how a consultant can yes yeah, shift that kind of power dynamic within a team but also bring in those new ideas as well um, and then i guess the last point of that is diversity um, of perspectives so absolutely bringing new ideas but also you know thinking about with consultants it could be a company in sydney and the consultant can be in melbourne so you know it really um, allows companies to bring in different perspectives but also 
also people based in different areas as well. Yeah, loads of advantages there, Kate, from what you're saying. Obviously, the unicorns don't exist, and that's why people applying for jobs only have two of the 18 skills that they're applying for. And something that I think will be really relevant in the future is cost as marketing um, departments are slashed. Um, bringing in contractors is a lot, uh, a lot more economical for businesses to do so. Um, and I really also like that one about challenging um, the hierarchies and creating diversity and bringing in mm. fresh thinking because can't continue to do that. The things, the way we've always done them moving forward. Okay, so um, over to Yolanda, we'd like to talk a bit about the barriers and benefits, the positives and the negatives of um, flexible working arrangements. And I know when I asked you originally, what were the negatives um, of, uh, what were the negatives of not having flexible working? And you said, look, there are none. Um, but I'd really like to hand over to you as a leader to yeah. talk about this um, in terms of flexibility. Yeah, well, what are the benefits? I think for me personally, the, you know, the biggest benefit is health. Um, mental health, physical health, um, and that is so important because what flexibility gives all of us is the ability to balance this absolute crazy world we're living in and all of these commitments that pull us in a million directions in a way that works for you. Um, I think, um, Ange, you spoke about, and Kate, you touched on it as well, you know, diversity. Flexibility allows you to bring in a real diverse team, um, people from different walks of life with different experiences who probably each need a little bit more flexibility to lean in and, and be the amazing people that we know they are. I think we often talk about the benefits. For me, the flip side of not being flexible um, is stress, um, burnout, loss of social connection, um, and actually the quality of the work you do. I think we've all been in roles or situations where the pressure has just got so high or life has pulled you into a million different directions and you know you can't be um, everything you are at work because actually you don't come to work as just a worker. You come to work as a, as a full individual with a, a lot of um, light and, and dark and shade in your life. And I think you know, not being flexible we pay the price somewhere, whether it is the organization by not having the right people, the individual through mental um, health or physical health, we pay the price. So for me now more than ever, um, we have to lean into what flexibility looks like for ourselves as individuals. And we have to be brave enough to have the conversation and demand the right level of flexibility that sets you up to be the best version you can be. Yeah, great points about um, mental health and, and the stress that it can bring if you don't have flexibility. But, you know, some organisations and some leaders um, still put up barriers um, within organisations for, for flexi flexibility. And I just want to ask you, what are the barriers that we need to overcome in organisations for flexibility to be effective in the workplace? I think the barriers are definitely about stepping away from this perception that work is happening from nine and nine to five. Um, I love Mickey's example of running out to the car and feeding the baby and running back because actually that's what we all um, that that's what we all um, cope with every day in one one way or another. Um, for me, it's overcoming um, and being more aware of this conversation around flexibility. And I think a lot of managers are so focused on the output or the work, you know, that the fact that somebody needs to sit at their desk and be visible, that, um, you know, that that becomes one of the biggest barriers, this mindset that work happens um, just in one place. And I think for me, that's probably the biggest hurdle. We need to start with changing that conversation. It needs to start with awareness. And the best way to build awareness is to have the conversation. Um, I sometimes think as women, and I can speak for myself here, you know, taking up the space, having that brave conversation and believing that, you know what, you are so worth having the little bit of flex you need or um, a different way of working to set you up in the best way. You know, you deserve that. And you've got so much to bring and so much value to add in any organization. Um, now more than ever, 
It's about making sure you have the conversation and you make your manager aware of what that means for you. Yeah, thanks, Yolanda. I think we're expecting quite a few questions about how to have that conversation ongoing um, at the end. So, um, Nikki, I know I've already asked you the question about the skills we need to build on um, in, in being a, a full-time to a contractor or consultant, and you talked about prioritisation inside and bringing new ideas. Um, I'd also like to ask you about, uh, is it difficult to build trust and rapport with team members when you're working on a flexible basis? Um, I don't know about difficult. I think it, it, it's different. Um, and I'm sure many of us have experienced that and would relate to that. But one of the things that strikes me is that um, I, I see parallels between working in that environment and, and how a lot of sports teams operate. Um, you know, whatever team, whatever team you're a fan of, quite often, certainly at an uh, international level, is any team is brought together potentially just a couple of weeks before an event or a tournament. You know, they're playing in different clubs or whatever, they're in different states, and they're brought together just for a couple of weeks before a tournament. Um, so, in, in, you know, in that sense, there's definitely learnings. Um, the things that are important in a corporate environment are the same that are, that are important in an elite sporting environment. Um, because we're all humans and, and at a basic level, we need to feel that we belong and we need to feel that we're significant in the environment that we operate in. And the other thing is that um, the foundation for that, for a team to perform well, is high trust. We have to trust each other. You know, we can't be watching our back all the time. So if we think about that and apply it to kind of a corporate environment, um, in a work sense, people need to understand what they do and they need to believe that it's important in the, over, the overall bigger picture of what the organisation does. You know, that, that sense of um, we have a purpose and, and I'm part of that. And then I think the other thing is that they need to feel that what they do has meaning. Um, and in a sporting environment, I mean, anyone that follows um, code, of, code of Rugby will know how successful the All Blacks have been. And, and it's not the captain and the coach that drive that success alone. The kit man, you know, the, the, the person that sweeps the changing rooms after a game, they all play their role in the team being success. And no matter what level you are in an organisation, if you feel that what you're doing is meaningful and significant and you feel like part of a team, then, then those are the key things that we can all relate to. And the other thing I think that um, we can consider from a sporting perspective is almost every uh, sports team will start, you know, this cycle of a season with some kind of tour or a, a session that's not related to being on the field of play. And that's about getting to know each other on a more uh, meaningful level than just what we do in our day job. I mean, that's something that's really important because you don't trust people necessarily just because they do a good job, um, you know, whether they're an EA or an MD, Trust is a more kind of fundamental thing and, and it's about um, people's values and their purpose and how they conduct themselves and their behaviours. And so you need to get to know your colleagues in order to really be able to trust them and vice versa. Your colleagues need to be able to get to know you in order to really trust you. So we can all think about how we can bring that into our daily lives, you know, whether it's your, your routines. And in some ways, I think the virtual environment helps that side of things because it encourages that informality. And I don't know about anyone else, but um, I find when you're on a Zoom call, you actually learn more about the people on the call than you would in the office because you see into their home, you know, you get a little window, whether it's the kids coming through the door, um, you know, or just seeing the pictures on the wall or the bookshelves for the studious. Um, but so, so use that, leverage that informality. Um, and, and I guess people have already said it as well, but, but be understanding of everyone's circumstances and be really tolerant because we're all, we've all got different challenges no matter what they are and it's just not always as easy to see them. So, yeah. Yeah, really good point, Nikki. And I think it comes back to what Yolanda said about bringing your whole self to work. You're not just half a person that comes to work. And obviously during COVID, those barriers have dropped, but, um, and we're on a fast track to learning a lot more about um, people now as we look into their homes. So over to you, Kate. Um, what are you seeing in a kind of hiring solutions companies are using now that they may not have used historically? 
Yeah, so, I mean, you know, we're talking a lot today about the future of work and I think, you know, it's promising, you know, a lot of new, no bureaucracy, flexible hours, amplified innovation, productivity, enthusiasm. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it may not come in the form of a unicorn employee um, or a star executive with a kind of corner office. Um, it will look very, very different. And I think it even now looks quite different. So, um, I mean, companies are, will continue to seek the best talent on demand. So, you know, that's not new. Companies are always looking for talent. It's kind of what, what is evolved is how they're going about doing it. Um, I think the other thing is, and Nikki, you kind of touched on this, but, you know, companies are looking at building a like what the teams of the future looks like. Um, you know, I'm ex Lemon, which is definitely a company that was really grounded in what's our purpose and values. And grounded in purpose and values um, and driven by data is what I think is needed to be able to remove these vigorous kind of rigid structures that perhaps have been, um, you know, I guess established in the past. Um, and also focusing on building workforces that are high quality people, flexible, but also available on demand. Um, you know, if we look at a lot of other things in our lives, it's a lot on demand. So, you know, why should not the workforce not kind of be in that space as well? Um, I think companies are also, as I've mentioned, are requiring specialists. And so, you know, for example, whether it's a, a large corporate who needs a CEO um, media trained, you know, it doesn't make sense to go and hire a full time or perhaps even, you know, traditionally it was about bringing on an agency. Um, another option now is can you bring on an ex journalist um, who's had communication skills, who's worked in agency, who can actually come on as a contractor and train your CEOs up or whether it's a small business who they just can't justify bringing on a PR agency, but they need, you know, to launch a product and so they need someone to come on and help with the PR launch and media relations. Um, there's now there's that look at, okay, well, what's the solution? And it's looking at kind of contractors or freelancers and how you can bring that into, you know, build your team of the future. Um, I think another point which I mentioned, but it's really important is that it allows companies to be able to, I guess, fill gaps, but also fill short term and long term. So maternity leave, um, you know, that comes up annual leave. How can you kind of, you know, look at how you can fill those gaps by bringing in those consultants and freelancers? over certain points um, or over busy times of the year. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's a mix of junior and senior roles that are being outsourced at the moment. So, you know, there are key roles like CMOs, Chief Marketing Officers, um, that companies are looking at, um, you know, keeping their core team, but also looking at how they can bring in that kind of strategic decision maker in on perhaps a, a contract base as well. So when we talk about consultants and freelancers, it, it does really sit both across that kind of junior and senior positions as well. Oh, I think you're on mute. Now. Great information there, Kate. And um, obviously the market's opening up as both employers and employees are looking for more um, part-time uh, and contracting roles. So it's all, I think, all great information for, you know, employers particularly moving forward, but also people looking to change a direction moving forward. And there's a bit of hope there for the future growth of careers outside of full-time. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, in you know, people employing consultants, contractors, about um, flexibility from an employer perspective. But Yolanda, I'd like to ask you, if I was working for you and I wanted flexible working hours um, and you were my leader, how, how would you respond if I addressed you with that question? And I don't think you'd be the first person in my team to ask me that. Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever worked at a company where um, where I haven't had my team or somebody in my team or the whole team at some point approach me asking exactly that question. Um, I think the first thing I try and do as a leader is sit down and understand why. You know, what has kind of happened that requires you to have flexibility? In some cases, it could be a, a life stage or an event that's kicked that off. And in many cases, um, you know, as individuals, we move through a whole, whole, whole raft of um, moments in our life. And I think we often bump into 
um, the joyous moment of, of starting a family and, and a majority of the asks has been around that and kind of what does flexibility look like there. Um, I think the first one starts with, well, let's understand what you need. The second one I always think about as a leader is, you know, can that person still deliver to the scope of the role and the responsibility in a part-time or flexible capacity? Now, that really depends on a lot of different things. For me, what I look, like, look at is, you know, the responsibility of the role, the deadlines coming up, some of those big pressures um, that we have depending on what time of year it might be in an organization. And um, something that's always at the front of my mind is making sure that, yes, we can hit the company objectives, but really more important than that, how do I set the individual up to succeed and to be the best they can be? Um, because the last thing I want to do is give somebody flexibility, but then there's such a big gap between my expectation and what they can actually deliver that, you know what, nobody is going to win. Um, the employee isn't going to look great and I'm just going to be under stress as a manager because I've got deadlines chasing me morning, noon and night. Um, what I do in a situation where I can see that, yes, the flexibility required and the role the individual in doesn't marry up, is I often look at what else can we potentially get the individual to step into. Is there a secondment or a great opportunity to swirl talent in my team so that I can give another team member the opportunity to step into this role at the same time giving my, um, my flex employee who needs that flexibility at that point in time an opportunity to um, try something else, broaden their skill set and still set them up so that they, um, they're delivering the best they can deliver. You know what, the main thing for me is it is a two-way conversation. And I think as um, individuals, be brave enough, and I will keep repeating this message, be brave enough to have that conversation, but then also open-minded enough to know that, you know what, you might need to be flexible when it comes to um, what that could look like that enables you to still get what you need and be successful as somebody in my team. So um, as I said, Ange, not the first time I'd get asked that question. And I think a question every manager should be really ready for. And again, get creative, um, keeping that individual at the heart of your decision making and making sure that we set everybody up to win, both the organisation and, um, and the individual. Yeah, thanks, Yolanda. And I think what's really key there is um, the fit. So you talk about the fit. So understand the why. Why is somebody asking for that? And then the fit with the current role and, and within the organisation. Absolutely. And I think, you know, flexibility, the word itself means just kind of be creative and find a way through. I've never hit a situation where the answer has been no. Never, ever. Because there's always a way through. And it starts with understanding, you know, why you need flexibility, how long you need that flexibility for, and what can we do to make sure that everybody in the situation benefits from the change? Because I think it's only a good thing. Thank you. Now, Adrian, over to you. We, um, we really like to understand from within an organisation and a people and culture perspective, how the impact of flexible working arrangements on Cricket Australia has been impacted and, and how this can be seen in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for us, I, I think, you know, earlier this year, we, we went through quite a unique um, experience. And I think most sporting, which most sporting organisations did, were heavily impacted by COVID, where we had um, quite an extensive stand down period of um, a couple of months. We then came back and we had a restructure and we, where we had about 40 roles that were made redundant. So we went through a massive change period. Um, and for about, and for us, it was just really making sure that we could adapt to an agile work environment. I think that for us, we, we went into, um, you know, especially this year and the cricket season that we're about to launch um, is one that we have never, ever seen before, one we have never, ever encountered before and hopefully don't have to again. Um, but it's really important that we adopt agile work practices. So um, we're, we're, you know, really thinking on our feet and making sure that we're ready for change. Um, Last month, for example, we, we conducted an engagement survey um, of our employees and we asked a range of questions on you know, different topics. And um, one of those topics was actually flexibility. So we asked a question and that was, 
we are genuinely able to make use of flexible work arrangements. We had a 93% agreement rate on that particular question, which is just um, outstanding. And you know, when we, we asked that every year, so last year, um, when, we, when we asked it, we have seen now a 13% increase in that question. And I think that that's really been driven by this whole environment of everybody working from home and feeling like they can actually um, you know, manage their day as, as they like and um, yeah, really getting the best out of it. So I think that it really shows that at CA, we are moving in the right direction. Well, that's a massive increase. And, um, and really, really positive responses. So well done to you. And how has the role of people and culture enabled this and how do you see this evolving into the future? Yeah, so um, at, during, at the moment in this current climate, we allowed our people to dip into their personal leave. So we, we, you know, we saw that there was obviously a lot of pressures happening at the moment where people were having to homeschool their children or, or take, you know, take care of their own children or their nieces and nephews. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we could support them and without them feeling like they had to work excessive hours to really catch up on their priorities. So um, we made sure we had it all over our comms platforms and really empowered our senior managers to be able to make that decision, to be able to sit with their employee and work out their priorities and say, okay, you know, you don't have to work nine to five. Maybe you can work the morning and then um, take personal leave for the rest of the day or whatever it might be, really being able to empower them to have that conversation. Um, another thing we did was we also dedicated an entire month to wellness. I think that it's such an, you know, it's a bit of a buzzword, but it's so important at the moment that people take that time to really focus on themselves. So um, we had an entire month dedicated to it and we ran multiple sessions. Some were kind of, you know, lunchtime fitness sessions, others were um, yoga, meditation, um, some nutrition sessions. And the great thing about it was everybody who ran those were employed by us. So we had some people run those sessions at lunch, you know, on, on, on our team's platform. Um, we had our nutritionist run a session for us. And it was just really good to get everybody back together and connected with each other online. You know, I think that when you're working with, you know, remotely, you're kind of talking to your team and that's about it. You're not really talking to the people you see on the stairs or in the kitchen when you make a cup of tea. Um, so it's really fun to have everybody kind of connecting in a, in a way that's going to be benefiting themselves. Um, and it was completely optional, but we had a really, really positive uptake of it. And since then, we wanted to make sure that we kept that wellness um, that wellness piece alive. So we've moved to Wellness Wednesdays where we run a session every Wednesday to just, you know, get everybody to take the time out of their day to, to have that, that moment for themselves, especially, you know, you might not be able to get a break with lots of people at home at the moment. And normally you, you've got that time off, you're driving to work, you're on your own, you're kind of having a moment. So for us, it was really being able to make sure that they were taking that time out of their day, um, especially this season. Um, so now we're looking at also other ways that we can keep that conversation alive and looking at incorporating a wellness platform so that people can actually take that time whenever, wherever and whatever day they like. So, yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Some great examples there, I think, of um, flexibility for the future that are working well right now. So moving on to the, the last word and um, what final thought you'd like to leave our audience with today um, on flexibility in the workplace. I'll start with you, Yolanda. Um, thanks, um, thanks, um, Ange. I think, you know, flexibility is a way of building stronger teams. It's a way of bringing new thinking, diversity, inclusion back into the team. But most importantly for me, it's about making yourself a priority. It's about making you a priority. Your health, your mental health, your physical health, your family, and I think for me, we should step away from this perception that you can't make yourself a priority, look after yourself and your family and have that balance, as well as make a great contribution at work. Um, I see too many women stepping out of the workforce or not coming back or not believing they can do those amazing roles because they don't feel there's room for flexibility. And the only way we're going to change this is by having the conversation. Be vulnerable, but most importantly, have the courage to sit down and share why it's important to you. Even when that manager is, is inflexible or they look like they're not going to listen, you know, the only way we're going to shift those mindsets and make the change in our industry, any industry, is by having that conversation, demanding that flexibility. 
because there is no reason in today's day and age that we can't have it and um, we shouldn't demand it. So my ask is be courageous, um, ladies, and for the men out there as well, we all need flexibility, gender neutral. Um, and I'd encourage you, you know, tackle that conversation and have it, but most importantly, you deserve it because you have so much that you can bring any organisation. No. I, um, I think some of the best advice I've ever been given is don't try and predict the outcome of a difficult conversation. So I think that's great advice. Um, even if you think the person's inflexible, have it anyway. At least you'll know the outcome. Um, Adrian, over to you. Yeah, look, I just want to second a lot of what Yolanda has said. I think that if you're worried that, you know, when your workplace goes back to normal or you're not able to work from home anymore, um, don't be afraid to have that conversation because if you know if you don't ask the the answer is always going to be no um, You know, and if you're anything like myself, I mean, I'm in my late 20s. I don't have children um, I I always felt like I couldn't ask for flexibility because it was seen as something that was for people with children or with you know fa You know families and things like that and I am um, about 12 months ago I did ask my manager look I said I would like to work 8 to 4 30 instead just to get that bit of time back in my day where I could go to the gym and get home in time to make a good dinner and actually spend time with, with my partner or with my friends. So I think that the, you know, the main message is just don't be afraid to have the conversation because you just don't know what the outcome's going to be. And I think at the moment, the mindset is really changing. So it's a really good opportunity and a really good time to really change the way you work um, and, and make a difference to your life. Thanks, Adrian, and thanks for sharing your personal perspective because I think a lot of our audience would really appreciate that. Kate, do you have any advice for companies looking to hire freelancers or contractors and also freelancers looking for work? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a kind of two-sided marketplace. So from uh, companies looking to engage uh, freelancers, always be really clear on the brief. Um, it's like, you know, whenever you brief an agency, be really clear on what the job is, um, you know, the budget, the time frame. ensure that you're setting up that consultant for success. Um, I think the same goes for the freelancer, you know, when you are pitching for work, um, freelancer consultant, we use all these different words, um, you know, be really clear on what your skills are, articulate them well, um, use past examples, you know, and also speak, a lot of the questions we get is, you know, what's the rate, what should I kind of pick, there is no kind of, you know, hard and fast rules, so, you know, I think as a, if you are looking to go into consulting, you know, speak with, you know, people who are previous consultants and have that conversation around day rates and expectations and things like that. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we, we are already moving towards this kind of contingent workforce. And so, you know, there is a lot of unknowns from both the employer and the employees. Um, but I think it's about just having those conversations with people who have done it before. Um, or maybe it's around, you know, just trying something new and seeing, you know, what works for you. There's no kind of hard and fast rules. Thanks, Kate. And over to you, Nikki, for last word. Um, yeah, I, mine just builds on um, Adrienne and Yolanda. Um, I think when you when you know what flexibility looks like for you, my advice would be be really open and live it and lead it um, and be really visible with it because um, it gives other people permission to Adrienne's point. If we think that flexibility is just for mums coming back into the workforce, then we're alienating everyone. And so whatever flexibility is, for you, I mean, I've got a, a great example of a, a boss I used to work for, a director who was male, who used to, as we called it, leave loudly, um, except in his case, it was arriving late and he wouldn't take meetings before 9.30, two mornings a week, because he dropped his kids at school. And for me, you can have all the policies that you like, but if you've got a culture that doesn't tolerate it, um, the policies are worthless. And that's why I say actions, in this case, speak louder than words. So whatever it is that your flexibility looks like, own it um, and live it because you are giving other people permission to have their flexibility. Yeah, great advice. Um, thanks, ladies. I've got some questions here I'm going to run through and I won't nominate who will respond. Um, but we've got a great one here, which is what impact does part-time work in particular have on career progression in the view of the panellists? Uh, Yolanda, do you want to start? 
Um, it's a great one. I might actually throw to Kate because I think Kate, you might have a really interesting perspective on this. I don't think part time should at all impact career progression. It's really about what you need at which stage of your career. Um, I'm starting an exciting new role on the 5th of November and I'm going back four days, not five. And I'm going to do that because for me, I want to invest that extra day in a whole raft of other things, um, least of all continuing my studies. So I don't think, um, you know, part time or um, going back in a flexible manner should or, 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 you know, has a foregone conclusion it's going to impact it negatively. I think it makes us stronger individuals and probably better contributors to the workforce if we get the flexibility we need when we need it so that we can contribute at our optimal level when we are fully engaged at work. Uh, Kate, I'd be interested to hear your view. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree on all of that. Um, I mean, from, you know, a consultant, you can be a part-time consultant, you can contract, or you can also be a full-time consultant. There's lots of different ways. So, um, I mean, one of the benefits from consulting is that you, as I mentioned, you get this diverse mix of clients. So, you know, one of the consultants on our platform at the moment works, I think it's uh, three days with a really large government department, but that also the fourth day with a small business. And when I chatted to her about that she was like well I actually want to be able to diversify my skills and say I've actually worked with a large government which we know is um, a big beast in itself um, and then I've also worked with a small business so I know how to scale up I know how to work in agile teams so I think whilst that's not directly that's a little bit different in terms of part-term versus full-time I think there's merit to both um, I think also um, in my past experience I think some of the most incredible leaders I've worked with were mothers who worked four days a week because they were so intentional and they were so productive they knew that they had X time to start and then finish, and they had a lot of deliverables in that. So, yeah, I would not see that impacting. I think it's how it's positioned. It's about how you're having the conversations. It's about setting expectations and also getting real, really clear on what does success look like in your role in whatever form. I might just add to that, Kate, as well, because I um, coach a few people, and this question has come up a few times in a slightly different guise. And it's, I'm worried about how it will look on my CV. Um, you know, whether it's part time or going into a, a more junior role or even, you know, a smaller company or a less high profile company. And I think right now everyone has total permission to do something different, something part time, because, you know, when we look back, everyone globally is going to look back on this year and probably next year and go, it's OK, it was COVID. And it, you do right now, you have permission um, to work part time, to not work at all. You know, whatever it is that you want to, this is, if you like, a, a silver lining of COVID and the expectations of what we do and how we do it are, are very different. Thanks. I think they're all really good points. Adrian, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, I think that if you're worried that your part-time work is going to impact your career, just make sure you're having an impact in what you're actually contributing. And, and that's what's going to have, that's going to be the result at the end of the day. You know, if you know you can come to work and give your 100% self in the hours or the days that you're working, there should be no reason for it to impact your career progression at all. Thank you. I have another question here, and it might be Adrian that answers this, but how do you best negotiate flexibility in a job offer when it's a full-time role? It's a really, really good question. I think that um, I could get that a, a fair bit with, with roles that I recruit for. Um, I think is, my, and I, I know Yolanda mentioned this before, is explaining the why. Um, you know, you, if you want to have flexibility in a new role that you're starting, and you know, it might be full-time and you want to work it, four days a week or, or whatever it might be, you need to be able to explain why and how you're going to be able to get those priorities um, in place in the days and hours that you're working. Um, I think that maybe even some employers might, you know, say, okay, let's trial this for maybe three, four months and we'll, we'll review it at this time. Take that offer because if you can, if you can trial it for, for three months in, in your first couple of months of work mm -hmm. and, and show that you're making an impact, there's no reason for them to say, oh, look, no, the role's going to go back to full time. So, um, you know, just really showing and, and negotiating that how, how you're going to make it work and, and why. Hey, Glenn, I, I actually want to build on that one um, because I think, you know, when you start shifting the focus to what you're going to deliver in the role, 
focus on the outputs, not the hours. Um, and if yeah. you have that conversation up front, um, there is no reason why you and your manager can't be clear on what you are expected to deliver and then being flexible around the hours you work to deliver that. Um, and be upfront, have that conversation off the bat. I agree with you, you know, from the outset, be transparent. And um, I love that whole, give it a crack, give it a try, and let's check in with each other to continue that conversation and make sure it's working for both parties. Just one, again, another build on that as well. I think um, these days more and more organisations and companies are realising the benefits and the need to offer that flexibility. So do your research, speak to people that work there, even just check out the website because chances are you'll find the company, um, uh, you know, speaking publicly or promoting the fact that it offers a flexible um, opportunity. And that is a great opportunity for you to say, you really appeal to me because of this Um Use that. Use it as use it to your to your advantage. A good one. Thank you, Nikki. Um, another question here: Do you think flexibility impacts productivity, especially in job sharing situations? Yes, positively. Yolanda. Uh, yeah, I think positively as well. I just think it's a good thing. Um, flexibility ensures there's, I think, on a job sharing capacity, you know, it makes us rely on, on better communication, more transparency, um, making sure we're collaborating, not just kind of hanging on to it, but sharing and, and, um, and talking about it. You know what? I, I just can't see the downside of flexibility. I have, in my experience, only seen good things come of it. And one of the best bits for me is, just the diversity of experience it enables you to have within your team. Great. Adrian, do you have anything to add? No, I just completely agree with you, Andrew. I think that it increases your communication, which at the end of the day is going to make you more productive because you're actually seeing what, have, what am I doing? What have I got? It, have I got everything in place for you know, whoever you're sharing that, that role with. So, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I, I can only see benefits in, in working flexibly. And, and I think that it just increases your awareness. I think if you're aware of what you have going on and, and, and your workload, it, you're, you're just going to be so productive that, um, you know, there's, there's going to be no downside. Yeah, great. I think also that employees that feel valued and empowered to work effectively in a way that suits them, give more discretionary effort, you know, they're more engaged, they're more motivated. Um, and therefore you get back that discretionary effort, whether it's extra hours or what they say, how they advocate for you to their network um, and how they strive to be better at their job because they really appreciate mm. um, the relationship and the trust and the empowerment that they've got. That's totally my experience. Nikki yeah. and I, I, I'm going to build on that because I think um, pre-COVID, um, I saw a lot of resistance from a couple of managers who just believed people needed to be in the office sitting there and I don't know what they're doing when they're working from home. COVID to me has almost been like a time machine that's fast forward us five years. Um, and I think it's forever changed the way we work as um, employees, as individuals, and it has forever changed the perception of organisations around what flexibility means. Um, I think COVID has probably been the biggest gift when it comes to flexibility and enabling that both from an employee side, putting the tech in place and making it a possibility for everybody in the organisations. Um, and I think even, you know, on, on the employee side, it's given us permission to try it out and see what it feels like. And you know what? Working from home and being flexible isn't for everybody. Some people actually enjoy being back in that office environment. And if you're a Victorian right now, I think you're busting to get back in the office and have any form of social connection. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I do think COVID has fast forwarded and it's changed it forever. Okay, I've got time for one more question here. And um, it builds on what you were just talking about, Yolanda, and how do you see flexibility evolving post COVID? Yolanda, you're going to have to. Okay, well, um, oh, I might throw to, I actually might throw to Kate as well, because I'd be interested to hear um, from your perspective what you, you think will come um, from the more diverse workforce. I, I just think um, forever and ever, COVID would have changed flexibility because it's now not going to be a thing we ask for. It's going to be something that we demand. 
and that companies will need to be um, geared up to deliver um, 24 seven, uh, 365, it's gonna be a new way of working. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I hope what people have taken from this today is that flexibility, like there's many, there's many different sides to it. So you've got flexibility as an employee. How do I go to my manager? You've got flexibility in terms of an employer, but then you've got flexibility looking at what does a flexible workforce look like from a kind of full time and consultant. So flexibility is such a broad topic. And I think from the, you know, the future workforce, if that's what we want to say, um, I do believe it will be the mix of of, you know, full-time consultants, freelancers. Um, it, it's happening now and uh, it has been happening for a while. And as I mentioned, the last six months have really kind of, I guess, expedited it to, to happen even quicker. Um, I think it is also from an employer's perspective, they've looked at what is it that we need. So I think, you know, the downside is there has been a lot of redundancies, which has really impacted people. Um, I think one of perhaps the, the positive sides out of it is as an employer, they've gone, what is it that we actually are here to do? And, you know, how do we perhaps restructure to not only just save costs, but also just to look at being more productive. So, you know, what are the gaps in our current organisation that we need to fill that perhaps are with the consultant um, you know how do we manage costs absolutely let's be honest that's always going to be something we need to look at but I think it's also thinking about how we bring in new ideas how do we innovate and it's not going to look like it always has with the traditional hierarchy it's going to look very different yeah thanks Kate Adrian do you have a perspective from a people and culture position yeah, I mean, look, I think it's going to continue to evolve. I think that flexible working post-COVID is going to hang around a little bit longer. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I think it's going to, be a while, going to be a while before we fully move into every day back in the office um, with 300 people in your building or, or whatever it might be. So I think that it's just going to continue to evolve and, and teams and managers are going to be really creative with it. You know, they're, they're, they're going to say, okay, well, maybe we work from home these days. Maybe we come into the office on these particular days or, or, you know, really make it a bit more purpose-based, whatever it might be. I just think that it's going to hang around. And now that so many organisations, so many leaders see how well it works, how the benefits that it can have on, you know, everybody's mental health, their productivity, um, and actually getting their priorities done. Um, yeah, I think that it's, just, it's definitely going to stick around. I don't see how, how it can't. Thanks, Adrian. Well, we're going to have to wind it up now, but um, I'd just like to thank all our panellists who have volunteered their time today and provided such great content. We will be sending out a summary of today's um, event online. We'll also have the recording available and um, uh, we'll be on socials, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and our committee in the background. And here are our contact details if you'd like to contact Marketing Women Inc. Thanks again. <laughs>